And I started off by ringing this little bell, and I just like to do it, so I'm going to do it anyway to start us off. So I add my welcome, and thank you for coming. A great turnout on this day here. And I'm wondering how many of you were here two and a half years ago when our guest spoke here in this room? A fair number. Okay, we were talking then. He had a new, a second book out, The Rain Man's Third Cure, and we talked about his first one. These were memoirs, autobiographical, deep reckoning with the 60s and 70s and so forth. And if you came today here hoping to hear a lot more about hippies and drugs and rock and roll, that's not what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we did, in fact, uh, our most recent newsletter at Commonweal. Uh, there were a lot of talks last year. You may know, remember that last summer was the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love. And I actually quoted our guest here in this saying, uh, there were a lot of people who were putting their lives on the line to make change, and you would think everyone was just going to rock and roll shows and wearing bell-bottom pants. But there was more going on there. And at that time, when his previous talk, he mentioned offhandedly that he was narrating a new Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War. Um, just working on that. So. We're going to start with that and talk about some other things. But first, please welcome back to Commonweal, Peter Coyote. Thanks so much. Thank you. So you are a master narrator, as the Emmy committees have shown and so forth. But I just want to ask you a little bit about just doing that, the craft. I mean, how does this happen? So Ken Burns does 15, 18 hours of documentary. Do you get a script this fat and you just sit down and start reading it in a nice studio? Or how does it work? Well, that's, that's what he wanted me to do. He, uh, <laughs> I'd done a series, the people who produced the Civil War um, for Ken produced a series called The West that, that I was the narrator for. And Ken decided that uh, he liked the cut of my jib, so. He wanted me to do the national parks. So they arranged a meeting and he came in. He's not a, he's not a big guy, but he came in with a pile of like yellow pads and uh, CDs, DVDs and magic markers and highlighters and tabs and just completely oppressed by the weight of material he was carrying. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, that's so you can play the DVDs and you can make notes and you can write it down and you can decide what you're going to do. And I went, oh, no, no. <laughs> I'll read it when I get in the studio. So there was a real chill that descended on the room at that point. And he collected himself and he said, uh, that will never work. You don't know how impeccable I am. <laughs> to which, with classic grace, I responded, you don't know how good I am. <laughs> So there was another little chill, <clears throat> and he said, well, all right, I'll uh, rent a studio for a month, and we'll take a shot. I said, oh, no, no, it's, uh, it's nine hours. We'll do an hour and a half a day, and we'll do it six days, don't worry. So on the third day, he said, I will never use anyone else. <laughs> so that was eight films ago. And um, so, I, you know, I just play jazz with it. I think that... Uh, like Allen Ginsberg said, first thought, best thought. I think the first time that I see the text, I get the most vivid pictures and the most vivid sense of what it is. And I don't have to think about technique. It just comes out of my mouth. Um, I, I don't think I get hired for my voice. My voice was my mother's voice. My, my mother lived in her own film noir and called everyone darling. How lovely to see you, darling. Her voice was kind of like that. She named me Peter because she heard Betty Davis say it in a movie once, and she said, I thought it was impossibly elegant. 
You know, we name our kids Dylan and Star and Jasmine. Anyway, um, but I get hired, I think, because I can read and I can take the reader through complex sentences with lots of sub phrases and I can carry you from the beginning to the end. And that's my job, is to make it clear. And Ken really appreciates that clarity and that I'm impossible to offend. And we just get along like a house of fire. Well, jazz implies improvisation. Do you read it exactly as written or do you ever change it while you well, in? Yeah, I wish. No, <laughs> I don't change the text at my peril. Yeah. But, you know, Ken, Ken and I have completely different internal music. Like, I'm a Jew. Jews are minor key people. <laughs> so if I'm doing a list, I'll go, there was a camera, there was a sneaker, there was a tape recorder, there was a boot. And each of those inflects up. That's completely unacceptable to Ken. He wants, there was a camera, there was a shoe, there was a tape recorder, there was a boot. And I'll, re I'll read two pages of text and he'll say, in line 16, you went up on and. <laughs> That's true. And I'll say, there's a window behind it. Why don't you open it and jump out? <laughs> anyway, no, they've done so much work. Like the Vietnam series had so many screenings to military people, conservatives, liberals, center of the rotors, historians, war historians, that you daren't take liberties with it. Um, I got, I got in a lot of trouble when that came out. Uh, I have a friend, David Talbot, who wrote, um, uh, what was the book about San Francisco? Season of the Witch. Season of the Witch, thank you. Thank, I'm getting addled in my old age. Anyway, he went, uh, went batch when Vietnam came out. He, he got to the first opening sentence like, this war was started by good people for good reasons and it went bad. And yeah, let me let me quote it because I was going to Oh, you have it? So, oh, good. But yeah, no, I mean, this was, I mean, so over two years ago, you're working on it, and it came out in the last year. Uh, it was, you know, I watched the first one just, this is a big commitment to watch something, but I just, I binge watched it, you know. I mean, I thought it was amazing and I learned a lot, but I did see a lot of the flack that you got, even though you didn't write it. But the quote was at the very beginning of the first episode, quote, America's involvement in Vietnam was begun in good faith, by decent people out of fateful misunderstanding. Yeah. Now, there are a number of progressive left-wing documentaries about the Vietnam War that I might have made, and my 12 friends saw them. <laughs> <laughs> but Stephen's task was to present to the broadest American public the cupidity of the generals, the lies of four presidents, who all knew the war was unwinnable and persevered because they couldn't get out of it and save faith. And he knew if he, he started out with those rat bastards in Washington, he would not have had the audience that he did. And so I, I just watched myself being excoriated on Facebook until I got, <laughs> I got tired of it. And so after about three days, I wrote a letter and I said, Boy, I, I want to thank all of you guys for the moral clarity and uprightness that you're helping me see. Obviously, none of you use electricity powered by fossil fuel or drive gasoline-powered cars or have computers that are sent to China to be dismembered by Chinese kids who catch cancer. And I went down through every cultural horror that we all participate in, even if we're against them. We're trapped in this web. There's no pure place to stand outside the world. And it was just like dropping a hand grenade in a hen house. The conversation just ended. <laughs> well, I, the thing about it that struck me among many things was there were so many, so many voices in the series of the Vietnamese, yep. both South and North. Uh, veterans and POWs, et cetera, so... Women I, soldiers? Yeah, and I, I could not see it as any kind of a whitewash of our involvement. I mean, America did not come out looking good in this series. We weren't good. We were invaders. We invaded a sovereign country for some, you know, big board Cold War 
guessed it was wrong that if Vietnam fell, the entire East would go to communism. I have a really good friend, a Marine named Brent McKinnon, who's the last man alive in his platoon. And when he saw the series, he wrote me, best thing that's been said or shown about the Vietnam War. And that was the only review I needed. So I don't really care what other people say, but uh, it's contentious. And of course, everything is played through a prism of present politics. So the forces that created and perpetuated the Vietnam War, the quote in the film of Lyndon Johnson saying to his CIA advisor, who would tell him every day to get out of Vietnam, and his response was, I can't get out of Vietnam. My friends are making too much money. Well, and so the media played a huge role in, in this, this era and the perception of the war. And I was very young, but I still recall every night the body counts being broadcast. You know, and it was usually like, we killed 10,000 Vietnamese yesterday and lost three soldiers, you know, and, and this turned out to be not quite accurate. And one of the great uh, episodes, or one of the things that went Mike Wallace, pre-60 minutes, uh, was embedded with troops there and traveled and came back saying this is a nightmare and a disaster and broadcast that from Vietnam. And then they had a tape of Nixon, you know, from the Nixon tapes calling the president of CBS and saying, you got to fire that commie bastard, you know. So the truth was not popular in this. Um, so can I say something yeah, about that? Yeah, sure. Hopefully the, this uh, little chat will lead to this direction. But... It's worth remembering for when we get there that in the, I'm a war baby, I'm not a millennial. I was born in 41, the year that World War II began. And from 41, certainly 40s till the mid 60s, the news was a loss leader for their corporate divisions. In other words, they were not expected to make money. They were like the hood ornament on a Rolls Royce. It was just supposed to exemplify the quality of the product. And William Paley once said to his reporters, don't worry about the money. I got Bob Hope to make money. So just file that story when we get to it. I'll remind you of that. Yeah. Have you seen the current recent film, The Post? I did see The Post. Yeah. I, I was underwhelmed by yeah. it. So this is about the Pentagon Papers and the Washington yeah. Post. Say more. I, what was what was? Well, I'm going to interview you? Daniel Ellsberg sometime soon. He asked for me to do that. And I mean, I think he's fantastic. I think it was, he was the first Edward Snowden. It was a great act of courage. The thing that underwhelmed me about the movie was it never made clear exactly why Catherine Graham did what she did. Everybody was getting very upset and they're running back and forth and she stands there for a minute and finally she says, let's go with it. And I thought it would have been much more interesting to know what it was that made her gamble her entire corporate mm -hmm. future and fortune to do that. Mm -hmm. So since that time, uh, there has been a something of a devolution, many people would think, of uh, the role of the media. And now with the internet world, we have what is called fake news, all other kinds of news as well. And so you, when I first asked you to do this, we were going to talk, spend a lot more time talking about Vietnam and everything, but you added a couple of essays you were working on about the whole kind of situation we're in now and, and wanted to talk about the history of how we've gotten to where we are now. So I would like to invite you to tell us what your current thinking is. The one that you sent me that we'll talk about is called four prescriptions for an ailing body politic, which is how do we get improve things? Yeah, but, how do we fix So it? that is basically the prescription, but if you will first give us the diagnosis. So it's pretty important to know that from 1941 to 1973, America came closer to creating an economic democracy than any country on earth. There was in force an agreement forged by Walter Ruther and the UAW called the Treaty of Detroit, where wages were tied to corporate profits. And it worked really well. 
Uh, workers had money. They kept the money in the bank. The banks had money to, load to loan to Wall Street to build infrastructure and to build factories and things like that. And the workers had money in their pockets to uh, demand products. And they bought washing machines and cars and winter coats and sewing machines and all kinds of stuff. Around the last year of the Nixon administration, a couple of things happened. One, Nixon cut the money off the gold standard, separated the dollar from gold. And the company, the, they froze wages. And in actual real terms, wages have never really improved from 1973. Production of American industries has gone up 40, 50 times. But workers in real buying power are not making any more today than they did in 1973. So the first unintended consequence of that was a drop in demand. And so they figured, well, we know how to do that. So remember coming home in the 70s and finding six credit card applications in the mail in your dish there? Yours, 20 grand. So what they did was they, they started credit cards. They started fanning them out, you know, like uh, chocolates to the natives. And they turned an entire quadrant of the population over to usurers. People charging 29% on loans, 25% on loans. This was made legal by the Congress, by the people that they elected to go and safeguard them. So for a while, that was okay. We had a lot of credit. People were disguising the fact that they were going backwards. But the economy was overheating. And uh, Nixon he, he cut the gold standard. They added uh, surcharges on imports. They cut off all the taxes on the automotive industry. In uh, 1972, the economy was growing 6% a year. In 1979, it was growing 9.5% a year. And they were starting to freak out because they couldn't stop inflation. The German mark was beating the dollar. It was like a vote of, of no confidence against the American economy. And in 73, we got the oil crisis. There were all these newly industrialized countries that were coming on board, creating the competition with our industries. And in 72, the market crashed for two years. And then something happened that they'd never seen before called stagflation. And stagflation is inflation, prices going up, money buying less, in the middle of a recession. So Nixon was out, Ford was in. By the time Jimmy Carter got in, they called in this guy, Paul Volcker, to run the Federal uh, Reserve. And Paul Volcker wanted to signal to the world and the banks and the bankers and the wealthiest people who keep their money in bonds that he was serious about fighting inflation. And he raised interest rates five points in a single day. The unintended consequence of that was the bankruptcy of 22 million family farmers who had listened to the ag agencies, who had listened to the government, who had listened to everyone telling them, forget about debt, debt is your friend. Your land prices are going up, buy heavy equipment, farm from fence row to fence row. 22 million. The leading cause of death on the family farm was suicide, highest in the nation. Farmers are not like us. If we lose our, com our, uh, our condominium, we get another one. Farmers are holding down the heritage of their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers, and it was a crushing loss. Bill Clinton cut the budget of the Rural Mental Health Agency. For every five farms that disappeared, a local business disappeared. So you lost the high school coach, you lost the FFA, Future Farmers of America, you lost the hardware store, and the entire Midwest was like a death zone. If you're wondering where the angry Trump voters began and where they might have come from. And the only people that helped these people were the militias and the far right kind of whack jobs with the little red copy of the Constitution in their pocket Use only silver money, threatening judges and sheriffs, anybody who took a vow to the federal government. And they came in and they held bake sales for them and they helped them at the, at the uh, auctions. They ran the sheriffs off and they told them, it's not your fault. 
It's the Jews, it's the Rockefellers, it's the Queen of England, it's the this, it's the that. And this fell on receptive ears because these guys had followed all the instructions and all the advice of their government. And this is where they had wound up. So around 1975, when Paul Volcker does this, it imperils the savings and loan industry because the savings and loan industry is now having to pay much more for money than it's getting for outstanding loans. And so they start playing fast and loose and you have the savings and loan scandal. $220 billion of family savings, pension funds, whatever, wiped out of the economy and two guys went to jail. Sound familiar? <laughs> Less than 10 years later, they did the same thing. They relaxed the restraints on banks. They relaxed the banking regulations. They, re they relaxed the divisions between banks and insurance company and investment firms, led directly to 2008. Almost collapsed the entire world economy. Not a single banker went to jail, not one, despite the federal investigator, the chief federal investigator who led the investigation of the savings and loan scandal, saying this could not have happened without corporate criminal malfeasance. Not 1% of fines were paid. And why? Well, Obama made more campaign money from small contributions than any candidate in history. And that amounted to 40%. The other 60% came from the people who should have gone to jail. Hedge funds, finance, blah, blah, blah. So I'm gonna tell you the name of a book because now we're up to where we are. There's a really important book that people ought to know about. It's called Winner Take All Politics. How Washington made the rich richer and turned their backs on the middle class. Two young economists, young to me, they're in their 50s. <laughs> but they're no lightweights. So J Jacob S. Hacker and Paul Pearson. Jacob Hacker got his PhD at Yale. He's a Harvard feller, fellow. He's the director of the Institution for Social Policy Studies at Yale. His website's jacobhacker.com. And Paul Pearson is the John Gross Endowed Chair of Political Science at UC Berkeley, Chair of the Political Science Department. And these guys wrote this book, it came out two years ago. And what they wanted to study was the current situation. How had it come to pass that the one-tenth of one percent was 700 times richer than the one percent, and the one percent was owned 90 percent of the wealth of the United States while the rest of us were, you know, paddling to keep our noses above a rising tide of shit. And they studied this exhaustively. They studied educational differences. They studied globalism. They studied robotics. They studied uh, opportunities. They studied Head Start. They studied childhood disadvantage until finally they got it. And what they got was so simple that it should be emblazoned on the Capitol somewhere. And that is that the one-tenth of one percent funds both political parties, yeah. funds the Democrats and funds the Republicans. This simplifies the task of the politicians. It's like your father owns a store that sells politicians and he says, what do you want? <laughs> we got them all. We got an urbane, educated, Harvard, African-American. We got a Bible-thumping nutbag preacher from Arkansas. You know, we got a blonde comb over and a fright wig, whatever it is, we got it. And it makes it really simple for the, for the candidates because all they have to do is run focus groups and find out the buzz terms, the buzzwords that you and I are concerned about to get to Washington because their real task is to get the keys to the public treasury. And when they get the keys to the public treasury, they begin paying back the investment that was made in them. And there is no better investment on earth than buying a politician. For $5,000, you can buy one. 
And if he extends your patent for 17 years, that could be worth a billion dollars to your corporation. There's no investment you can make on Wall Street that will return that kind of money. So these paybacks to the corporate donors are invisible to the voters because it's tax law. It's never reported in the news. You never hear about it. Or it's sending an aide into an office and saying, oh, don't worry about the language in this legislation. If you call what you're doing this, if you call what you're doing that, it'll be okay. And so here we are with the entire Congress conscripted as a concierge for the corporate financial sector. So, and you can see it, it's as clear as the nose on your face. 97% of the American people are calling for stricter gun control, stricter background checks, the, the uh, sequestering of military weapons. And the Congress is doing nothing. That means the Congress is the Congress of the 3%. And that's what it is. That's who they are. So we are in a dire state. We no longer live in a democracy. We think we do. And the language of our political system is still democracy. But we live in a corporatocracy. We live in a, in a country in which every policy, every option is designed for the profit and benefit of corporate financial and real estate interests. And we are now being treated as citizens the same way we've treated people in the third world for the last 40 years. And doesn't feel good, does it? Everybody's going backwards. There was not one Republican that did not vote for the tax break that's going to take 41 million people off their health care. Not one. Not one. 40 million people. The, the taxes, the, the money they're spending now began with Reagan. The Republicans may talk about fiscal probity, but since Ronald Reagan, they've run up huge deficits as a calculated strategy that they call taking the money from the kindergartens. And who are the kindergartners? That's us. That's the people who want Social Security, who want Medicare, who want um, safe working conditions, who want all sorts of social programs, which they call entitlements. Everybody in this room has paid for their Social Security. Social Security is not in any trouble except that they've borrowed millions and millions and millions of dollars from it to run their wars. So we're in, we're in kind of a dire strait. You can see they're doing their best to roll back all Obama's um, environmental programs, health programs, all the stuff that actually benefits us. Everybody thinks they hate Obamacare until they're told that what they have is Obamacare. So this is a real problem. And I don't think it's going to be solved by Washington. I don't think you're ever going to get a pig to take its snout out of the trough, <laughs> just putting a fine point on it. And I think that people who are benefiting from this system have a hard time voting against it. So to watch these young kids from Broward County, Florida, stand up and be doing the business of the nation at 14, 15, and 16, and receiving the calumny of men making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, accusing them as actors, being actors, I'm a Buddhist priest, and I'm thinking, start the killing. <laughs> so, I wrote this piece that I gave to Stephen, and it's not, I can think of four things that really kind of have to be done if we have any hope of having a democracy. And then we can talk about how it might get done, but I'll just run them out and then maybe we'll open for questions or something. So the first thing is you cannot run a democracy without an agreed upon base of facts. You just can't do it. We've got a 24 hour a day propaganda organ in Fox News and then we've got everybody else. And as long as you can, you can say that's fake news, all of public life becomes opinions. 
So this was not the case in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The news was widely respected, widely regarded. When Walter Cronkite soured on Vietnam, it was over. So the first thing we need is to get the news divisions of the corporate media removed back to nonprofit status. And if we have to pay taxes to make up for the money they're going to lose, we should do it. Because we can't run a democracy if we can't have facts. We can't think about policy if we don't have facts. If we suspect everything is being partisan, we no longer have a hope of conversation. And then in return for the use of our airwaves, our airwaves, our airwaves, everything they say must be provable. It must be sourced in fact. You can't just let people on the air to lie. I heard a guy, a British guy, talking about the floods down in Los Angeles. And he said something really interesting. He said, you either subsidize, you regulate, or you subsidize. You regulate and you say you can't build houses in a flood zone, or you subsidize the rebuilding of these houses every year when they get wiped out. Well, if we don't regulate the news, if we don't say at least what you say has to be true and you have to source it, we're just in a, we're just in a kill zone for knowledge. So that's the first one. It's a tall order, but it still somehow, some way has to happen. If we're willing to pay for uh, objective news, we ought to be paying for the entire electoral system. Why should our congressmen and representatives be going to Washington, paid for by the real estate, Wall Street, and, uh, and health industries? Why should that happen? We hire them, we should pay for the elections, and as they do in every single European country, the Netherlands and Scandinavia, Every candidate gets the same amount of money. For six weeks, they go on every television station, no minders, no handlers. They can ask each other questions. There are no polls allowed for three weeks before an election. At the end of six weeks, the people vote and go back to their lives. I watch the news every morning while I have my coffee, 15, 20 minutes, and it's just around the clock, year in, year out news, like we have nothing better to do. So these guys know they don't work for us. They don't respond to our interests. They don't respond to our concerns. The entire Congress is able to sit there and go like this to the citizens because they know they're working for the 3%. So that's got to happen. The third thing is that all the money, even if we didn't have publicly funded elections, Citizens United has to go. The Supreme Court allowed Citizens United to pass because they said, oh, well, donations will be transparent. People will know who's giving money to candidate A and candidate B. It took less than a month for super PACs to be created that made every donation anonymous. We don't know if Russia's funding a candidate, if China's funding a candidate, if the Koch brothers are funding a candidate, if George Soros is funding a candidate. It's all invisible. So we have been disenfranchised from the electoral process. We don't have anything. We get the vote on a selection of guys that come from the same store. I don't think that's my idea of democracy. I don't think it's yours. There's one other, and then I'm done, and I'll ask, take questions. You can see I spend too much time alone. <laughs> <laughs> Public funding of elections. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's two more. Two. I was, gonna, I was counting. I was yeah. going to get there. Yeah, <laughs> so another, another criminal enterprise is the um, agreement between the Republicans and the Democrats to allow one another to gerrymander their election districts to raise their chances of re-election. So, of course, we have a volatile and vicious electoral system because no one has to compromise. 
the, the election districts have been jiggered so that all conservative Republicans are in one, all medium Republicans are in another, all liberal Republicans are in another, and the same for the Democrats. So we have about a 97% re-election of incumbents, which equals the Soviet Union's re-election campaign. So we need to have a body redesign the elections. It's happening by in lawsuits now. But an election district should, as well as possible, mimic the demographics of the rest of the country for age, gender, various um, gradations of the spectrum from left to right, so that when candidates campaign, they're forced to try to find honorable compromises among all the, the parties. Yeah, it's harder. It's more difficult. But it breaks down the kind of um, armed camps on two sides where everybody's talking to just their own base. The guy in the White House lost the election by three million votes. But we have this archaic anti-democratic electoral college which we should have fixed in the Bush versus Gore election, but we didn't. So gerrymandering. And then the fourth one was Oh, yeah. Here's something. Tell me if this makes sense. Why do we allow corporations to spend their treasure influencing public policy for the benefit of their shareholders? I'd just like to know. Every employee of a corporation is free to vote. They can all vote. But we allow this non-person, this quasi-legal fiction that a corporation is a person, to spend its treasure influencing our public policy for its own benefit and its shareholders. Now, I don't know. I like to see my grandkids on Facebook, and I like to watch my British murder mysteries at night, but not to the degree that I want to see my entire life swept away from me, or that I want to see my children's future. When a room full of adults is clapping because we've opened the Anwar Reserve in Alaska to federal oil drilling, I know that I'm looking at a group of men who've decided to die with all their toys. And they've said, F my children, F my grandchildren. They'll figure it out or they won't. But that's what we're facing. We're facing the last gasp of 1950s white men that would like to go back you know, old black Joe's in the cotton fields, Missy Mom is in the kitchen, and the boys get to do whatever they want, make war, make money, do whatever, and treat the environment as a sump. So we're going to have to figure out how to stop that. And I'll throw out, just to be consistent, just to prove that I actually thought about it. <laughs> I'll give you an idea. So Move On came to me a long time ago, and they wanted, they wanted to talk to me about Move On, about what they should do, and I suggested then campaign finance reform was a key. But I actually think they were smarter than I, I was. They wanted to get a seizable goal. They wanted to do something that they could win at, and they did, and I think they were probably righter than I was. So my idea for the only way that this might happen and there are guys, campaign lawyers that I know who can do this, is you draft a petition. And the petition would have the points that I've raised on it, you know, nonprofit news, full federal funding of elections, end of gerrymandering, blah, blah, blah. And you put it up for free on the internet and anyone can replicate it. And you encourage ad hoc citizens groups to take them to supermarket parking lots, to baseball games, to little league games, to soccer matches, to church groups, wherever they go, and they start collecting signatures. Now, I promise you, when you go into a candidate's office, if you have 100,000 names on a petition, and the petition says, if you will back this agenda, we vow to work for you and support you. And if you don't, we vow to work against you and make your re-election the most expensive campaign you've ever done. I think the pressure has to come from outside. I don't think the Congress will ever do it. 
It's too comfy, it's too cozy. And the TV stations themselves, if you look at the shooting in Broward County, the one thing that's been framed out of all conversation is the money. I did watch a father of a dead child uh, excoriating Marco Rubio, who could not answer with a simple yes or no whether he got money from the, from the NRA. Could not say. But suppose he did say, they'll give him money again. So the only hinge that we've got in the system is the vote. That's still the hall pass they need to get to Washington. So unless we can affect that vote, not only by turning out 100%, but basically by changing the whole game so that they don't get to get money from corporations and um, you know the richest people in the world, I, I'm afraid we're sunk. Uh, but I remain a radical optimist. And radical optimism is based on one incontrovertible fact, which is that we never know how things are going to turn out. So if you keep your shoulder to the wheel, it's like buying a lottery ticket, you might win. <laughs> so I try to keep cheerful, and I try to keep my shoulder to the wheel, and just because I don't know how it'll turn out. Because otherwise, I'm sure I would be on the sniper tower with a rifle in Washington somewhere. <laughs> so I'm, I'm open to any questions. Well, unless... let's, let's talk a little bit here first. Okay. Um, you seem to think that money in politics is a problem. <laughs> Did I make that clear? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I think it's the core problem. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, a, yeah, I mean, it's a fact, really. Um, elections, though. So since we talked here last time, there was this election. And a lot of people felt in this community and elsewhere that the election wasn't going to matter and didn't matter. Um, I had people on all different Life's sides. Life's hard for the stupid. Yeah, I mean, so, but there were a lot of people, uh, the Bernie Sanders supporters and so forth said that, you know, there was no difference between the two. I, my career has been in healthcare and environmental stuff. I could not see that. Um, the election happened. It's been surreal, really, ever since in terms of what's going on. Certainly a big backlash on all of the things that came out of the movements from the 60s mm -hmm. and all of that is going on. But you seem to have a faith in an election, you know, an election's going on. So is it about, I mean, I'm looking, the cover of the Chronicle today, they have one of the young people from the uh, gun Howard. tragedy. She says, she's 18, we are a ticking time bomb of voters. And if you've watched some of the videos of some of them talking, I, I mean, it chokes me up some of the, what they're doing. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, Phenomenal. so do you feel that this is sustainable? The problem, you know, you said, I think in one of your books you wrote that the walking around, well, this is going way back to Grinnell College. You were in college, you were part of a uh, anti-nuke demonstration, you know, walking around, I think you said walking around waving signs, carrying flags, et cetera, protesting. Well, didn't Kennedy, really... Kennedy invited us in the White House. Yeah. First picket group in the history of the White House. Kennedy As invited, a college student. Yeah, Kennedy yeah. invited us in. And he was, had read about us flying to Arizona and we met with McGeorge Bundy and who was his national security advisor. And the, just as we were going in the door, the fellow of our group, there were 14 of us, that we had elected as our spokesman, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you take this one, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at this guy, McGeorge Bundy, and I, I got it in a flash. I mean, this guy could have been my pirate father. Uh, I realized that we, we were just a problem he was going to solve for his president. We were no more important to him than people standing on the dock waving at the Queen Mary that's taken off. We actually thought that we were coming, bringing information from the hinterlands to educate our politicians, to let them know what young people were feeling. And I realized this guy dealt only in realms of power, and he would never be swayed by a bunch of kids waving signs in the street. And I thought, if I'm gonna get this guy's attention, I'm gonna have to come back with an army. 
And it was a couple of years later that I had high hopes that the army might be the counterculture. And? It wasn't. Yeah, so protests happened. The, I was too young for the Vietnam ones, but I remember the, you know, George W. Bush, the anti, let's not invade Iraq protests. I was in those in yeah. 2003, the biggest in history. They went right in anyway. Nothing had happened, you know? So Millions that's why I'm wondering, pushing a little bit on the optimism, what's going to be different? What could be different now that would actually have the influence? Well, my fear is that, um, I, first of all, I so admire those kids. I'm so fired up by their articulateness and their, you know, they're, they're trauma survivors. These guys have the moral credibility of combat veterans, but they still believe that the political system works as it's described in high school civic classes. And when you don't own the soapbox, when you don't own the television stations. Remember, when I was a kid, my dad brought home seven newspapers every day. He brought home the Daily News, the Daily Mirror, the Journal American, the Herald Tribune, the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, and something else. And each of those newspapers had a constituency and a slightly different bias. And his feeling was, read them all, and then you'll know what the entire city or country is, is going through. Well, that's all been consolidated into three mega corporations, which own everything. So it makes business sense, you know, vertical integration and all this stuff. It doesn't make cultural sense. You have three mega corporations defining the entire frame of the vo vocabulary. So I'm sitting at night and I'm watching these guys on the news, the you know, the talking heads describing, will this be different, will it? And none of them mention the role of money. So these kids are gonna grow up and they're gonna be individual voters and maybe they'll have enough mass and maybe they'll get enough people with them to deny some of these people access to, to uh, Washington. But, I mean, look at Donald Trump. I mean, he just lied got into office and then betrayed all the people that put him in there. So until we take care of the source of wealth and power that puts these people in Washington, I don't understand how we can expect 18-year-olds to make a big difference. Yeah, they are getting some great donations of big amounts of money, so hopefully it'll... They are, but you know, even George Soros and, and Tom Steyer and all the money on the left, it just doesn't approach the combined wealth of the hedge funds, of Wall Street, of the finance, real estate, and what's FIRE? F-I-R, finance, real estate, and the insurance, thank you. Yeah, it, yeah. it just doesn't. So we can't spend our way there. You have to have a, a systemic change. And what I'm afraid of is that systemic change is being totally blocked from conversation. Mm -hmm. the, well, so you, you talked, your first, first point, we'll, we'll get to you. Your first point was about facts, you know. So you can imagine people in science and medicine and so forth are going crazy now because there's so much crazy about that climate or whatever. Pick a topic and it's nuts. Who do you trust? I mean, where do you go for what you think is the best sources of information? Well, I range around. I, you know, my favorite news used to be Al Jazeera which closed down, right. at least commercial, global stuff. I kind of skirt between the BBC, CNN, MSNBC, and then the New York Review of Books, strangely mm -hmm. enough, which has great political reporting and articles that are very, very in-depth, and then sometimes foreign affairs, and then, um, you know, I just read a lot. And so it's, it's not that I trust anyone, but... I do trust, you know, even on CNN or MSNBC, they don't want to get caught with their knickers down. I mean, it's embarrassing. They have professional standards to uphold. It's not like Fox. It's not like Rush Limbaugh, you know, who just lies like he's taking a the crap. They actually have to check and double check and they substantiate and they have two or three or four sources. The whole idea that you can start a television station based on a fixed ideological premise 
and call it fair and balanced, right. and you'll build a whole audience, and you can broadcast this stuff day in and day out and challenge the admittedly imperfect institutions of the news. But, you know, just because your sweetheart has a mole on her cheek doesn't mean you throw her over. I mean, they're basically pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm kind of, in one way, I'm like your dad, where I just, I'm a news junkie and I get all these different publications and just to get the pers the spectrum. And so you, one thing, you, you didn't mention the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. If you read these every day or regularly, they're alternate universes. They're supposedly reporting on the same world, but they're different Perspectives. There, there's, a, there's like almost a Freudian slip. If you get them delivered, the New York Times comes in a blue bag and the Wall Street Journal comes in a red bag. Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. this, is this intentional? Listen, I'll never forget being on a demonstration when I was a freshman in college, civil rights demonstration, and the New York Times ran a big article on it, and the very last line of the article was, many of these groups are reputed to be communist. Yeah, right. You know? Now, believe me, I'm... I had communists in my family. My mother's cousin was the first man fired from the New York City school system for being a communist. 28 years later, he sued him and won and got 28 years back pay. We had, you know, lots of old Jews pushing push carts, but they were communists because they thought it was a better political system. But I watched the McCarthy period break these people, cost them their jobs. I haven't saluted the flag since I was 10 years old because I watched these people lying. I had grown men crying in my living room as a little boy. Used to be political freedom meant that you could subscribe to any political philosophy. It didn't mean you were trying to overthrow the United States. I've never seen the communists run a system that worked but that doesn't mean that Karl Marx didn't understand capitalism and the flaws in it, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't trust anybody, to be honest, but I'll read it, I'll think about it, I'll see how it balances up. And then I go to guys like Hacker and Pearson, where they have this winner take all, they have statistics and study and it's sourced and you can look it up yourself. And after a while you say, well, this is a trustworthy voice. They're not selling a bill of goods. They're not ranting. This is pretty fact-based stuff. Well, Ralph Waldo Emerson 150 years ago said that reading the news is like bathing in blood every morning. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it can be depressing. I mean, is anybody here not depressed who wasn't before you coming in? You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the reality is is challenging in this way, right? So, well, I actually uh, make my money selling mood elevators, which I have. <laughs> downstairs after so so we will entertain some questions and I do mean please questions you know not lectures oh and, they and sat still will, for me I'll sit still I know you're you're that's you're why they're here not so um, and I'll repeat it because we are recording here so you want to go ahead sir. I'm just curious did you see the New York Times uh, a full half page that with everyone in Congress and their phone number and then the amount of money they take from the NRA. Right. The New York Times published all the money and phone numbers. Yes. I didn't. Yes. Yeah, I only get it on Sundays. That's, I'll find that. So the New York Times published a full page of all the politicians who took money from the NRA with their phone numbers there saying, please tell them we don't approve. You know? So, I mean, that's one way to start. 3,000. You know? yeah. yeah. This woman back here. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, there is a question here, but I'm going to do a little tiny bit of estate. They have an interest in finance. They are shareholders. They are health care workers. So where is this revolution coming from? Seriously. So we're all part of the system, or many of us. Where does a revolution come from? this room grew up with seven newspapers into their house every day? I'm sorry. That's great. Okay, let's, do you have a response or do you want to? Well, you know? first of all, I haven't said the word revolution <laughs> once. You've said that. Okay. Second of all, I'm just describing how the system actually works. And it's true, you know, you can, there's, there's gold out there. It's, it's scattered in the haystacks. You have to really put out a lot of work and for people who've worked hard all day long and they're just staying above water, they, don't, they may not have the time or the energy left at the end of the day to... Let me, let me, let's, let's move to another question back here. 
you say about uh, the status of uh, net neutrality and also uh, news in social media? What about net neutrality yeah. and news coming through social media? Well, as I understand it, net neutrality means that everybody gets access to the same type of service. You don't have a tiered service. And once again, I think it's, it's critical. Once you cr create hierarchical differences based on what you can afford, the people who have less money get pushed into lesser service, lesser flows of information, and they're at a disadvantage. So, yeah, I think we should all have the same common denominator. I mean, that's the reason, actually, that I'm a socialist. I think, does everything have to make a profit? Can't we as Americans say, well, there's lots of space for entrepreneurs here and there and everywhere, but couldn't we agree that light, heat, power, railroads, and the internet just break even? I mean, we could do that if we wanted to. Healthcare. So, healthcare. yeah, healthcare. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's, I don't know too much about it. And the, the same thing, like, I don't think people should be allowed to go on the internet anonymously. I always sign my name, and I think it keeps people polite. When people are anonymous, they can be rude and snarky. I was writing an online column for the uh, Chronicle when Phil Bronstein was the editor, and I actually answered everybody that, you know, <laughs> came on and said what a jerk I was and this and that. I'd go to their own website. I'd find it. And, and I always said the same thing. We've got a platform. It's too easy to say how stupid I am. Why don't you run out your own ideas? Why don't you use this opportunity for dialogue? And not only did I get a lot of apologies, but Phil said he never saw more people rewrite their positions in the time that he was on the paper. So, but you still had the trolls. You and I had the same. We were both yeah. we were both city brights bloggers for yeah, the right. Yeah, and you got just swarmed with you know. Yeah, you that. do. But I don't so, know. That's my all I know about it. I don't know much about it. Question in the back. I'm really glad that you discussed the internet, and I think in honor of John Barlow, we really should pursue <laughs> that. I hope you put that in your platform. But I'm wondering, really, how watching the news all the time affects you? Because I don't watch it at all, but came. To the exact same conclusions that you did. <laughs> How does watching? Well, I watch the news like I watch the news like I watch clouds came in, turn into camels and Eskimos. You know, it's just sort of a phenomenon out there, and I I look for patterns, and you know, I'm a student of human behavior, and it, it just doesn't bother me. It just. Yeah, it me. I mean. I watch Trevor Noah and The View. <laughs> Trevor Noah and The View. Yeah. Question here in front. Yeah. Um, you know, we seem to have lost our moral compass. Mm -hmm. and that seems to be a big problem. And I'm wondering if you think that technology has actually facilitated the loss of our moral compass. Have we lost our moral compass and has technology facilitated that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a really quick parable. I worked for Jerry Brown for eight years, the first two terms as governor, and I ran the state art agency for him, and we had a really good run. We kind of helped a lot of community institutions. We raised the budget from one to $18 million a year. And the day after he was out of office, the new guy came in and he cut the budget back to a $1 million. And I thought, gee, I don't, I don't really have another decade to waste on something that can be overthrown by fiat. So I had already been a Zen student for about five years then, and I just decided to double down on that. Because when you change people, when they see something that they hadn't seen, when they see the world in a different way, or when they have an internal experience, they never slide back. So I think one of the big problems is trying to do mass events and deal with nuance on a mass level. I'd rather make a sandwich for a hungry guy than give a speech to a thousand people about world hunger because the making the sandwich can be modeled. Okay. So it's true, I have all these ideas and I'm talking to a room full of very patient people, but the truth of it is, what do you do every day? How do you treat every person you come in contact with? Are you, do you practice being universally kind? Do you pretend that you don't have shadows and all the evil in the world is on them? That's the moral compass. The moral compass is to understand that there's a, 
an invisible pregnant energy in the universe that creates everything. It throws up human beings and solar systems and hummingbirds and dolphins, and we're really all made of the same stuff. So the salient question is, gee, how is it that you came to believe that way? That's so different in my experience. But if I talk to you that way, I'm not judging you. And you'll know you're not being judged, and we can actually have a conversation. And curiously enough, the people that saved my bacon in Sacramento were conservative politicians who had the majority. I'll never forget, on my last finance committee hearing, there were three, like the Mount Rushmore, the three old conservative guys were up at the table, and they sat looking down at me very sternly. They'd met me now for eight years. And just before they started to speak, they pulled out these three hippie headbands and put them, <laughs> put them on their head. Uh, and it was very moving to me because they were saying goodbye, but they were acknowledging me. We had become friends with differences. And I think that's the moral compass. I mean, there are lots of ways you can be immoral, but nobody's going to really uh, be in control of it but you. And you can't be smart enough to escape eventually getting found out. Just ask Paul Manafort. You know, so... <laughs> It's, it's, I, I meditate. That must be why you're an optimist. Well, I know what I can control. What I can control in this universe is my intention. And I meditate every day and I try to keep track of, am I angry? Am I leaking envy or jealousy or something? You know, I can clean my house. And person after person after person that I meet, I try to do that in the same equitable way. I can't control this internecine fight on the part of the oligarchy, this war between the Republicans and the Democrats and different sources of capital. So that's why it's not my responsibility to solve it. So it's my amusement to think of, well, what might work? I should have warned you that you're talking to an editor of the Bellinas Hearsay News, the power, the power <laughs> media, you know, this is the big media. Question right here. Yeah, um, segueing from the law of the moral compass, perhaps, I want to go back to fake news. Uh -huh. I mean, I think we have, obviously, your idea of how we get past this. So how do we overcome yeah. Fox so News, I, fake news? And, I think this you know. woman here was correct in the sense that there's lots of gold nuggets out there. But we need to understand that everything that exists today came from something just before it and that came from something just before it. So here's a real quick history lesson. When, um, who, who was the conservative Arizona senator who ran for president? Barry Goldwater. Goldwater. When Barry Goldwater lost the election, various, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, hired Lewis Powell, who later became a Supreme Court judge, to write a white paper on what happened. They went nuts. And he identified the two most dangerous enemies of the American way of life as environmentalists and consumer advocates. 1964, 65. You can read this white paper online. Lewis Powell is his name. And he laid out an agenda which has been assiduously followed for over 50 years by conservative, wealthy people the Cox, the Coors, the Ensilier, Rensselaers, all of these people. He said, sweep the college campuses for the brightest kids. Give them free room and board in Washington. They began handing out million dollar grants with almost no strings attached. If the Democrats give you $10,000, they'll give you a 100 page form to figure out, to justify it. Put recording studios in your think tanks. Start these think tanks. Um, buy your authors, publish your authors. And they've done this for 50 years and they've moved the entire dialogue of the United States way far to the right. So that what's called the left wing today, Bernie Sanders aside, is the center. And this has been the result of hard, assiduous, uh, scholarly work and strategic work. So 
These were the same people that began running for the school board and the library council and the council that determines what school books can be bought. They've been doing this for 50 years and now we're seeing these little canker flowers show up and we're saying, oh my God, the people have suddenly gotten terrible. No, this has been money deciding, taking a long view and we have to be as patient and we have to sort of decide on priorities. You know, I have a couple that I just seem more important than most to me. One is nuclear accidents, you know, nuclear issues, global warming, economic democracy. Those are kind of the three that I, that I try to concentrate on. So we're gonna have to come to some agreements and we're gonna to have to start putting our money where our mouth is and contributing to think tanks and magazines to begin to come up with a counter narrative. Because right now, the counter narrative has shifted the political spectrum from the center to the right. Mm -hmm. Got a lot, if you could be quick, we'll get through some. So right here and then. I completely agree with you. It's our charge. I mean, take it back to. So this is about you the kids on, are very yeah. smart, and even you if they may not plane, know the facts, they're very. You go on a powerful. plane. The cockpit door is steel and it's barred. Right? You can't get into many skyscraper office buildings in New York without getting past the desk. You, can, you have to go through a turnstile. You have to get a pass. So we could have bulletproofed and hardened schools a long time ago, but it cost money and we didn't spend it. But I'm for those kids. So another question was here. I just wanted to um, ask about what your thoughts are on divestment as a movement. Like, um, I don't know more. And, you know, people pulling out of their money out of corporations. That seems yeah. to be like a big action. Is divestment a good strategy in various ways well, of war? I, I don't have enough money to make much of a point, but it seems to me fair enough. I remember divestment was a big issue in the apartheid struggle, mm -hmm. and it certainly caught the attention. I mean, my I keep thinking if you really wanted to make a change, you would ask everybody to stop shopping for a month. <laughs> literally, to buy the minimal amount of gasoline, the minimal amount of new stuff, to go to used stores and just make that part of your message. We're not going to keep this ship afloat as long as you're shooting black men in the back while they're running away, as long as you're murdering kids. So that's like divestment. That's like trying to take your money out of the system. So I think divestment is a good idea, but I don't know a lot about it. There seems to be some happening with the NRA now. Have you heard of uh, yeah. Reverend Billy and the Stop Shopping? Oh, he's right. an old friend. Yeah. He started here in Bellinas, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. Back here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pretty much we're the same age, and I know right. people that are running. So what do concern people who are hoping for a blue wave, a reaction? What can people do to actually move this along beyond voter registration? Because one of the big problems in the last election is just a lot of people who might have voted better didn't vote at all. And, you know, beyond, say, voter registration, is what else? What can be done? That's a, it's a really tough one. You know, Barbara Boxer was a friend of mine and a woman I really admired. And a few years before she retired, she voted to spend a billion and a half dollars on the F-22 fighter jet that the Pentagon didn't want and the Army didn't want. And I know why she did it. She wanted to stay in Congress and fight for women's rights and choice and the environment and all the issues that were critical to her and her constituents. Losers don't make policy. And that was a hard fact. And the people who wanted that F-22 fighter jet were the stockholders of, the, of Lockheed that was building it. And so we take really healthy goldfish and we throw them into polluted water and then we blame them for getting sick. The system itself is toxic. And so I struggle all the time with this. Do I give $500 to somebody running for office where that 500 will be dwarfed by 
other people's money coming in that I don't know their values or what they're about? Or do I give it directly to an NGO or a charity or something that's doing really good work? And I sort of do that one on a case-by-case -case basis because we can never outspend the, the sources that are, that are trying to turn the United States into a business. And so I'm not going to preach to anyone because sometimes I get very cynical. I remember, I don't want to name this guy, but I remember when we were fighting spraying in Mill Valley, uh, a liberal candidate that I had supported ran a bill through Sacramento where the sprayers did not have to tell what chemicals they were using, right? So nobody's hands are totally clean and it's, it's hard to know what to do. And that's why I keep thinking we have to change the source of money. But corollary, the lesser of two evils is less evil. Mm -hmm. And I would have held my nose and voted for Hillary. I mean, just no question about it. Well, the other one I always think of is the perfect is the enemy of the good. Of the good, yeah. All right. Um, I want to ask you somewhat, maybe it's personal, I think you've been touching on this somewhat. Back in the, going back to the war, when, and I was a young kid on TV, I saw a monk burn himself yeah. to death in front on TV. I've never forgotten that, you know, and it was, a, I only, I mean, when you're a kid and you see this on TV, what does this mean? What's going on? And I only learned about it a bit later. I read one of Thich Nhat Hanh's diaries that he wrote of that time, the Buddhist commitment towards engaged Buddhism in action. Mm -hmm. Now you, in the last couple of years, have become a Buddhist priest. Um, you've, I think you've touched upon it today without saying specifically so, and your next book is going to be about Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, how does this inform your advocacy, your, your outlook on all of this? I mean, do you, is everything ephemeral and it doesn't, you know, you're, it's just gonna do what you can and it's all gonna pass anyway, or no, no. lessening suffering in the world, all of these teachings from Buddhism, how does that inform what you do now? Well, that was the underpinning of what I said to yeah. this man over yeah. here. So. It's like when I went into the movie business, I'd come from the counterculture. And I thought, Jesus, how can I go in the movie business? It's like the height of ego, it's money, it's crass. It's... And it occurred to me that it was not the content of the movie I was making, but the way that I made the movie. And so I made a commitment that I would show up on time, I would work hard, I wouldn't argue with people, I'd treat everybody from the lowest PA to the director the same way, I would practice patience, um, I'd bring my best self to, my, to the game. And about every two films, someone would say, hey, do you have some kind of religion or something? <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, why'd you ask? And they'd say, well, I don't know, you never get angry, you're always on time. So. Buddhist practice informs the way I, I treat everybody, or I try to treat everybody, um, knowing that we're not fundamentally different. This woman disagrees with what I have to say, but she and I are made of the same stuff. So she has experiences in life that inform her decisions and her impulses, and they're just as valid as mine. One of the things we tend to do is we tend to not own our own shadows. We tend to say, I'm all, I'm all good over here, and evil, cupidity, immorality, and sloth is over there. And of course, those people armor themselves, and they're sending the same thing back to us. So until you relax people and give them at least the basic respect of being as worthy of existence as you are, and the butterfly is, and a salmon is, then nothing is gonna happen between humans. If we can't agree with, with humans, who are we going to agree with? Who are we going to work with? So it's probably the work of many lifetimes. We say Buddha's still somewhere working on himself. I'm not going to get myself worked out in one lifetime. But it's my intention to do that. And my intention is the only thing I can control. And so that's my task. And that's, that's what I judge myself by. Well, Peter Coyote, thank you for coming back to Commonweal. Thank you so much. <laughs>